All praise going on is most certainly due to the most high, the God, the patriarch, Savior, and my husband, Jacob. And peace to you in the name of his son, Jesus. I count it truly a blessing each and every single time that I can come before you and preach the word of God. And never do I count it as a light thing to do so. All right, brothers and sisters, I want to get right into today's message. And today's message is uh, a specific one concerning something that Paul wrote. And um, the reason I'm doing this is because, you know, Paul's writings, nothing wrong with Paul. But if you don't understand, you could actually... Uh, really have misunderstanding about overall what the plan of salvation is and so just like people come to paul and say that he did away or nullified the law in some way which he did not that he had the power he did not have the power to do so neither was he saying that or that he's going to take one other thing is that some kind of way you're going to heaven and again paul's writings um two things about paul's writings one they were philosophical two um, they are responses to specific uh, issues, okay? So it's like you're not privy to what was being said to him oftentimes. You can infer in a number of cases. But I want to read something here. And if you read it in a vacuum, you would think that he's saying you are going to heaven. This is in Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 6. It says... Well, let's pick it up at verse 5. It says, Even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, some will say, if you stop there, if you read that, some will say, see, we're going to heaven. He said we're going to be sitting in heavenly places, but that's not actually what's being said. If you read closely and in context, this is not talking about taking you off to heaven. The Bible doesn't say you're going to heaven. Jesus said on a number of occasions, um, no man hath ascended up to heaven. Then he goes on to say, also, these are found in the Gospel of John. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Okay? The Bible talks about a heavenly kingdom being established here on this earth. That's why he even told you to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The Bible tells you, it says that if you overcome, you can sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Where is Jesus' throne? Or Yeshua's, Yehoshua's throne at? It is on this earth in Jerusalem he's gonna sit on, on the throne of, his, a throne of his father David he's gonna reign for a thousand years then that kingdom is gonna be delivered up to the father you see New Jerusalem coming down from heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband like he said if I go to prepare if I go I shall if I go I go to prepare a place for you if I go I shall come again and bring you into myself then you see New Jerusalem coming down then you keep on reading Revelation you have the father and the son here no more flesh and blood just resurrect the beings and the Father and the Son here on this earth. He made this earth to be inhabited. Not just with people, but ultimately with he himself. It's going to be heaven here on this earth. On this earth. Okay? So, so now, when you understand in, in totality, then you, then you know that there is no... Uh, you understand that he's not telling you to go to heaven. He couldn't be possible. He even talks about the resurrection of the dead. You know, and when that takes place. But let's pick this up again in Ephesians 2, but let's pick it up in verse 1. He says, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what has he done? The Christ has made you alive. Okay, at one time you were dead. Okay, because of sin. He said, when in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Okay, so you are a rebel. You were a child of the God of this world, none other than Satan. He said, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as ourselves. But God, who was rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. So now we're, we're, we are made alive with Christ. Okay, that's just like he said, by grace, you are saved. Let's hold our finger here. Let's show you another example of what he's talking about, how, you know, this union with Christ, this being raised up with Christ. He was resurrected, but we have a type. He died and was resurrected. We have a type of death and resurrection here. This is Romans, the sixth chapter. Just show you another example of how he how he's speaking. Romans six and verse one, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So here we see the same concept of being dead to sin. 
He says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Okay, so what does that mean? That means that, oh, you has to die and a new you comes up. That's symbolized in baptism. He says in verse four, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father, just like he was resurrected. He says, even so also, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. OK, so that's eventually what's going to happen. He said, knowing this first, that our old man is crucified with him. So that, oh, you has to die. So, you know, that sinner. And then he says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. But we are raised in Christ. So that so the baptism is a burial and a type of resurrection in a sense, symbolically, in the sense that you go down and a new type of creature comes up and you're waiting for the ultimate deliverance from from this body. The ultimate deliverance is the resurrection, eternal life. And you are in a position to receive it. You are in a privileged position, but you have not received it yet. But how do you receive it in the first place? This oneness with Christ. Because you are one with Christ, now you can be one with the Father. But it is through Christ. And that's what's being told here us here in Ephesians. When he said... And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? That is not, you're not, if you think about it, he says it in present tense because it applies to the believer who is reading it at the particular, at that particular time. But it also applies to the reader, the believer that is reading it at this particular time. He's telling you of the position that you have in Christ. Christ is sitting on the throne of the Father. See, he has... He has been resurrected and been exalted into that position. Like he said, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. He got that glory again once he died and was resurrected. Now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. The question is, will we be sitting on the right hand of the Father in heaven? The answer is no, because that's not what he told you. See, that's not what he's been... This is all coming to this earth. Again, he told you to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Jesus is strong. The throne, he said, you can sit with me on my throne, is not in heaven. That's the Father's throne. Jesus is strong, will be on this earth. And he's going to give you those things of which you have been privileged now, you have a right to, that you will receive at a set appointed time. That's why if you keep reading Ephesians 2, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Okay? So there's going to come a time when this is going to take place. He said, so now let's go to another place here. Let's go to Colossians just to show you this. What's going to happen in the time to come? Colossians, the third chapter. And see, again, if you don't understand the scriptures and what's prophesied and the gospels, when you get to Paul, you read it in in out of context and according to the already biased uh, and quite frankly corrupted interpretation that you find in Christianity, you'll think you have a soul inside of you. You'll think you're going to heaven. You All these things are wrong. You'll think the law is nullified. The Bible is not telling you that, though. Paul is not telling you that. We'll tell you what the problem with Paul's writings when you don't understand. But this is Colossians 3. And let's pick it up at verse 1. He says, if ye then be risen with Christ. So again, it's that same type of language. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. See, but again, so I'm seeking that which is above. I'm seeking heaven. That's not what he's telling you. He's talking about what you should be focused on. Verse 2, listen, he says, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. Not that you're going to heaven, but that you need to be spiritually minded. He said, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Again, he says, you are dead, but now you have eternal life, but you don't have it yet. You still in the flesh. And when I say in the flesh, I mean this fleshly body. Not that you walk in according to the flesh. You need to be spiritually, spiritually minded, walking according to the spirit. But it says, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So again, here's that oneness with Christ. And now, because Christ is a of the father but now you can be of the father through christ so now there's a oneness there 
That's why even in one place, he says, he says, I go to my father and your father. Go tell my brethren. See, he's already done what we are trying to do. And in a privileged position to do, but it hasn't been manifested yet. It hasn't come to fruition yet. The adoption totally hasn't taken place yet. The dead are still dead. Those who have died in Christ are still dead. He says, when verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, meaning the one that's giving us eternal life, shall appear. He hasn't appeared yet. We're waiting on him. Right? That's what the disciples, they told him and asked us, um, tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He won't let them tell you all these signs. He talked about the abomination of desolation. Then he told you immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's when he's going to appear because that's his sign of appearance. Verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What is that talking about? You'll be resurrected. We're going to talk about that good. That's why it goes on to tell you, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, the covetous which is idolatry for, for, idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Same thing we were reading earlier. But again, what does he tell you in verse 4? When Christ who is our life shall appear. That's when he returns. Then shall ye also appear with him. Then you come in with him. How is that the case? He says, in glory. How is that the case? Because he's coming down. You're going to come up to up with him and meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what he tells you in Thessalonians. But you're not going to stay in the air. You're going to come back to this earth and take over this world. But you're going to be a resurrected being then. Let's go to 1 Corinthians because he talked about this glory. Let's... Because again, we have to understand what's happening here. This is 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we'll pick it up at verse 20. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. He was resurrected and become the first fruits of them that slept. Because even when you look back in the, in, the, in the Torah, when you see the first fruits and had to be waved and accepted, that's symbolic of him being accepted before the Father. That's why he had to tell Mary, touch me not, for I'm not going to to my father. But then he came back. Later, he appeared in the, in the, just in the midst of them, just appeared in the room because he had a different body. And he said, you can handle me. Why? Because he had been accepted. But he is paving the way for us. See, that principle of one paving the way for somebody else, you see that through the Bible. You see, you see for example, you see Moses paving the way for Joshua, right? One bringing you into the wilderness, out of bondage, but one bringing, and then another bringing you over the River Jordan into, into freedom. Yeshua. Or Yehoshua. Uh, but, now, but now you you see that. You see John the Baptist telling you about the one that's to come. And it came in the spirit of Elijah. And then what do you see? You see our Messiah come. See, that's a principle. So Jesus has done that for us. He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, that's talking about Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. See, Adam brought, he opened one door. Another principle. He opened one door. That door was to sin and death and all that comes with it. Our Messiah opened another door, which was eternal life. And the defeating of sin and death. So he said, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. He, so one brought death into the world. One is bringing eternal life. That's why he said he is our life. He said, for as in Adam all die, Adam is our father and we have been dying ever since. Even though we try to deny it. We go to a funeral and say the person is not really dead. Death is real. And the dead are indeed dead. Their soul is not floating up anywhere. If you, you, you go to the dust of the ground, from dust thou art, to dust shalt thou return until that time of his appearance, until the time of we have the first and even have a second resurrection. That's the, happens. the second resurrection occurs a thousand years after he's reigned. 
So it says, for as, an atom all, for as an atom all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, they that are Christ, when? At his coming. We're waiting for his appearance. So that's when you have the resurrection of the dead. You don't have people in heaven right now, but if you misread Ephesians 2 and 6 and some other places, quite frankly, you can be led astray into thinking that the, the dead are in heaven and that you are headed to heaven when the Bible doesn't say that. Even when it says here, then come at the end when he shall have delivered the kingdom to the to God, even the Father. Like I said, that kingdom he's going to establish here on this earth is delivered up to the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all power, all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy shall be that shall be destroyed is death. But he talked about that glory, right? That we'll have when he appears. Verse 40, uh, let's pick it up at verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial, he says, is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. See, there's a celestial body, an eternal body. He says in verse 40, uh, one, there is one glory of the sun and another, and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. We're going to find out when that raising happened. See, people, you, that's what I'm saying. Even when you think about, just a side note, even when you think about the resurrection, Jesus Christ, the first was there that Christ went at his coming. Think about that resurrection. When they went back to that tomb with Joseph of Arimathea, put him in, that, that, the body was not there. They said he's risen. He was resurrected. How is it that if that if, you, if people in heaven now and they soul float off, which is not the mode of the resurrection, how come if you go dig those per, that person up, they still there? That's because people don't know they have been deceived. And they have gone after Greek philosophy. That's what's happened. But it says, and I'll show you that more so later. But it says in another lesson, it says, it is, a, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. I'm in verse 44 in the middle of it. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. He didn't put a soul inside of man. He said the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam is Jesus. A quickening spirit. So what does that mean? That means he went back to being eternal. And he, remember, he's paved the way for us. Jesus Christ, the first fruits, they that are Christ at his coming. That's why when you go back to those, to the feast and it's described, it's talking about one on Pentecost, bacon with leaven. Leaven represents sin. That represents us who are imperfect, but can be made perfect through him. And that's how we went back with the father because we are, we are made perfect with Christ and only him. That's the only way we can have justification. But it said, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now it's clear who that is. That don't mean you going to heaven, though. Because again, you can sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat on my father in his throne. Jesus' throne is in Jerusalem. That's where he's going to reign from. The whole Bible is telling you that. He said, as, so then just, just so that's clear, let me just show you that real quick. Because I've alluded to it twice. I might as well read it for you. So, you. so you understand. I might as well read it for you so you understand. Let's, uh, let's pick it up real quick. Just to show you where that king of uh, his throne is. Let's just uh this is gospel according to Luke. 
And I want to pick it up in Luke chapter 1. And I just want to show you what the angel said unto Mary. It says in verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not. I mean, Luke 1 and 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he, again, David reigned in Jerusalem. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Okay, one more place here. Let's pick it up at uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, not 1 Corinthians, but uh, let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Because one thing you need to understand about Paul's writings, 2 Peter 3 and verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the script, other scriptures unto their own destruction. And that's what's happening today. That was happening then, and it is happening today. So be mindful. Thank you for your time.